How should followers of Christ respond to radical Islam? Every day our news is filled with disturbing stories of violence and terrorism from the Muslim world, which often lead us toward fear, anger, and frustration. Should the primary response of Christ followers be shaped by a political or national worldview, or a biblical heavenly one? This episode of The Mission Table is brought to you through a partnership with 1615 Church Missions Coaching and Shepherd Staff. Shepherd Staff exists to partner with and facilitate local churches by helping them effectively mobilize their people, resources, and gifts to send and care for their own members who have been called to serve as missionaries outside the U.S. Not a missions board, but a non-denominational resource serving the local church. With decades of global missions experience and a passion to empower the local church to fulfill the Great Commission, Shepherd Staff Mission Facilitators is a tool in the hands of the local church to help extend her reach. Find more at ssmfi.org. Watch, reason, and participate. How should followers of Christ respond to radical Islam? Join us for this episode of The Mission Table. Welcome to season two of The Mission Table. This season, we are again tackling some of the most critical and controversial topics impacting missions today. And the way we do that at this table is by asking questions. We wanna ask questions that provoke and move conversation. And ultimately, we hope that these conversations then move God's people into action. So I'm pleased to have with me today, Doug Lucas. He's the founder of Team Expansion. Jeff Jackson, the founder of Shepherd Staff Missions Facilitators, Keith Swartley, who's the founder of the Encountering the World of Islam course, and Chip Lusco, longtime Calvary Chapel pastor and media consultant. So we have an especially controversial topic today, guys. How should followers of Christ respond to radical Islam? The table's yours. You know, one thought that occurred to me when I heard you advancing this question is that it's such a relevant question because it's so popular and so uh, predominant in the news, but it's a shame because it's actually a very small, just minuscule fraction mm. of the world of Islam. And so unfortunately, the whole religion of Islam gets a bum rap out of what a very, very small number of people are doing, severing off people's arms and heads, and shooting people and blowing up buildings. It's actually a very small percentage. It's just a shame that it becomes the dominant thing that we talk about. Okay. I think education is the first issue, Matt. Uh, people, the church was behind the curve. The whole, the whole country was in 1979 mm -hmm. when radical Islam reemerged in Iran. It caught the CIA and the Carter administration by, by surprise. I mean, it wasn't even on the radar back in the day of the Kingdom of the Cults and Walter Martin and all that. All the, we spelled M-O with an O, Muslims, back then. Baby boomers did. So we need to be educated. There's, there's two varieties of, of Islam, Sunni and Shia, uh, the five pillars of Islam. We need to be educated about the, the broad scope of Muslims, first of all. You know, as you look at the whole of the Muslim community, that's one part of our answer as we look at how should Christians respond. It's not just to radical Islam, it's to the rest of the Muslim community. Um, but it, in starting in on that question, I'd say, well, how, how would Jesus respond to mm -hmm. radical Muslims or, or anyone with a um, virulent um, understanding of how to achieve the ends that they want to achieve? Mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, Greg Livingstone said a long time ago, is God up in heaven unaware that there's a billion and a half Muslims? Mm -hmm. and I think that thought should give us some comfort as we enter into that discussion mm -hmm. that God is sovereign that he is in control, that he has a plan to reach all nations. That includes Muslims in his plan. Christ died for them, desires to redeem them. And then it encourages us, us to look at things that maybe aren't in the news, that Muslims are coming to Christ. Um, the Iranian revolution, one of the outcomes of the Iranian revolution is that many, many thousands of Iranians uh, came to Christ as a result of seeing that side of Islam. And, and I think, uh, you know, in, with radical Islam, it's sort of in, you can put it in the category of things that are opposed to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. It's just a little more extreme than mm -hmm. other uh, ways that's expressed. And, and I think, you know, I think of Jesus in the first, his first sermon there in the Sermon on the Mount where, you know, he says, listen, you guys have been told, you know, uh, love, 
love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But listen, here, here's here's what the kingdom of God is really about. You know, love your enemies, mm-hmm. do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you, and and because of the context that we've grown up here with in America, you know, in a in a condition in a context that's been so favorable for, in a sense, the easy propagation of the gospel. Those kind of things that Jesus said, and even what he said in, you know, in John 16, where he says, hey, listen, guys, there's going to come a time you're going to be put out of the synagogues and there's, you know, there's going to be opposition to you. People are going to kill you and think that they're doing God a favor by doing that. And so all of those texts, I think, are becoming mm-hmm. relevant now. Mm-hmm. And um, you would never plan it this way. We would never intentionally, you know, script it out this way, but that's what God's doing. And I think radical Islam presents perhaps the greatest opportunity that we've had to let the whole New Testament become relevant for God's people. I think there's great hope getting through to them. I mean, Paul was a terror, terrorist. In yes, day. absolutely. God okay getting through absolutely. to him. That's right. But I wonder if we're underestimating the scope of radical Islam. And not only that, the sympathies, uh, even in the, the reformers, the moderates, um, 50% of American Muslims uh, would, are open to Sharia law being imposed. Uh, 35% believe that jihad is warranted. So I have to understand that maybe there's a little yeah. broader uh, sympathies that lie out there for radical Islam. Right. But so often we think that uh, we are the enemy, uh, that they are somehow targeting us. Uh, we have to remember, uh, Matthew, that around the world today that uh, radical extremists are also focusing on Muslims themselves. Yes. They're, uh, in fact, more often than not, those are the people who are losing their lives. They are Muslims that are not so extreme, that are being killed by the extreme factions. And as a result, we sometimes we think that the war is between Christianity and Islam. The real war is between Satan and everybody else. Amen. And C.S. Yeah, right. Lewis put this into, I, I wrote some of our workers in, in preparing for today, and, and they said, Doug, remind them, please, of C.S. Lewis saying, we actually have kind of parachuted in to a kingdom in which Satan thought he had dominance. Yes. And in reality, Jesus, the king, has arrived. And in a way, we are here to sabotage Satan mm-hmm. so that the king can take his rightful throne. It's actually Satan that's the enemy rather than Islam. And if we can get that through our minds, many of these folks would become best friends with us. It's just that we have this image of yeah. machine gun toting, explosive vest wearing people. In reality, they want to find a way to feed their grandchildren and get their sons a job at the local car shop, just like anybody else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was um, in New York City shortly after the towers came down, um, working with Billy Graham Evangelic- Evangelistic Association with Calvary Chapel. And we were doing some training of the short-term teams that were coming in to do some ministry on ground. And my wife and I went to, um, I can't remember the name of the deli, the sandwich is this tall. Carnegie. Carnegie. Okay. Mm-hmm. It was an awesome sandwich. The pastrami <laughs> was awesome. <laughs> And uh, our waiter and the busboy were clearly Muslim. And my wife and I befriended them. Again, this is on the coattails of 9-11. Mm-hmm. And um, we got to know them. We started asking questions. Um, you know, there was engagement going on. One of them was from Senegal. Another one was from Tunisia. And uh, the waiter at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, I just have to ask you, why are you and your wife being so kind to us? You clearly know who we are. Mm-hmm. And I said, well... It's because of Christ. And I said, let me tell you what I believe, you know, and my wife and I were just like, what an amazing opportunity. And he said, well, I, I'm, we're going to leave the United States. He said, um, so much, you know, contention is coming upon us and pressure. And again, understandable in some ways. We had just been attacked. I'm not minimizing that at all. But as I left New York City with my wife, I thought the church is going to blow an incredible opportunity Mm-hmm. to reach out to Muslims in this context mm-hmm. because the door had swung open, you know? Mm-hmm. So you mentioned this. I think radical Islam gives believers an opportunity Definitely. to reach out to some of those moderates and, yes. you know, those things as well that may not fit in that category. So that might be one of our responses is not let radical Islam distract us, Taint us. from showing right. yes, the love and the grace of Christ to others. You know, fear and hate are not our family values. Mm-hmm. But the, the, all, all anything Satan does in this world is going to try to push us towards enmity, right. towards mm-hmm. others. Right. Um, I would disagree with you a little bit on your percentages. Yeah. Um, but but even if the percentages are that high, um, I think we still have to ask ourselves, how how is anyone attracted to the gospel? Mm-hmm. Um, and it tends to be through a personal relationship uh, with friendship. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Satan has yet to invent a defense against the prayer of the saints and the love of the saints. Yeah. You know, under uh, the totalitarianism of the the 40s uh, through the early 90s in the Russia and the Soviet Union, um, we saw the inhabitants of that great area of the world as the victims of a terrible regime. And so what did the church do? We prayed for the believers in that area, that they would be faithful in standing for the gospel. Uh, we didn't pray against them. I think oftentimes when I hear great and wonderful churches talking today, I think Muslims would feel like they're being prayed against Definitely. rather than being prayed for. Yeah, we were talking about Acts 2. You know, persecution is coming on the early church. Um, religious zealots are persecuting, you know, this brand new fledgling church of Jesus Christ. And I'm always struck by the fact that they gathered and they didn't pray for deliverance from the opposition. Yes. They prayed for boldness to proclaim the gospel. Yes. And, and I think that's another, you know, how do we respond? Let's pray that God gives us boldness to proclaim this truth. And that, I think, Matthew, is the message we have to get out. And people like David Garrison that are that are researching what's happening around the world are speaking to us now with documented facts about the response from Muslims. Mm-hmm. I was just finishing the task out in L.A., and he, he chronicled, uh, after years of research uh, funded by a, a, a nice size grant that sent him all over the world to do it, uh, he came back and he discussed this research with Pew Foundation and a bunch of others who, who would help him put it into a shape that people could understand. And he chronicles that century after century, the movements that came to Christ out of Islam were just smallish, 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 until you get to the 1900s and it starts to pick up. And then when you get to the first 15 years, uh, in other words, this last decade and a half, it shoots up like a rocket and he looks at the crowd. And now this is a video you can actually go out and watch on, on Vimeo. He looks out of the crowd and he says, you are living in a time when we are experiencing by far, profoundly more, the greatest ingathering of Muslims to mm. Christ in the history wow. of the world. And mm-hmm. it's happening right now in this time when you're asking this question. And I bet you're right with what you just said a while ago. Radical elements within the house of Islam are causing many of the modern elements to be yeah. so embarrassed. They see believers in Jesus bringing food to the people of Somalia and risking their lives for mm-hmm. it. And they say, there's got to be something to this or they wouldn't be risking their lives. You know, we keep talking about God's sovereignty. And I think it's such a key element in understanding this and processing it as Christ followers. Mm-hmm. He's enthroned. He's not taken by surprise. And if we look at Revelation, we know that one day surrounding the Lamb of God will be worshipers from every nation, tribe and tongue. Muslims will be, you know, former Muslims will be there. They're now going to be worshiping him you know, Christ will be victorious. There will be suffering. There will be sacrifice. There will be blood leading up to that. Mm -hmm. But he is absolutely sovereign. And didn't we see this in China? I mean, what seemed like a great defeat for the church in China turned out to be God's divine plan to disperse his people. And I wonder, you know, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, who knows, going, wow, look what God did through what was seeming opposition. Maybe so, right? Maybe so. So how do we, you know, in a place where, Many of our fellows and believers in Christ are, are afraid, um, frustrated, um, uh, feel apprehensive uh, towards what's going on in the world. Um, sort of want to pull in, pull in their heads, you know, uh, close the shutters. Um, how do we encourage them to see what is going on in the world from the perspective of what God is doing um, rather than the, the protection of self? Great question. I think prayer can make a huge difference. I, uh, I'll, I'll ask a neighbor sometimes, a guy, maybe an immigrant from Iraq or from Syria in the city where I live, uh, can I pray with you about your son getting that job or about your daughter getting through school? And uh, it's established a relationship sometimes that defies uh, cultural boundaries. So. Mm-hmm. You're saying praying for? Praying, praying. praying for the with Muslim, them, with them. With I got them it. Okay, yeah. Them. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think uh, when I was when I was pastoring in Phoenix and, and working with refugees on a day in day out basis, some of the refugees had come from you know Myanmar, Burma. Um, they'd been persecuted incredibly, and therefore that's why they ended up going to Thailand and then being resettled into the Phoenix area. One of the things that became very clear to me is that. All of them defer to me as an American pastor, hmm. and they want me to teach them 
uh, more about the word and leadership and so forth. And it became very clear. I need to just be quiet and listen to them. And so the point is, there's much value for God's people in the U.S. to be learners from those that have actually navigated and lived mm. out king the kingdom in hostile environments around the world, which has been the norm throughout Christian history. Right, right. So I think learning from and being willing to be taught by people that, you know, have lived in a context where the government is opposed to God's kingdom, th there's much to be gained from that. If only someone would put together a course on Islam. <laughs> You know anybody like that? <laughs> My website is encounteringislam.org. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, in our course, uh, we see about 30% of the people that are in the course are not coming from uh, how can we missionally reach out to Muslims. They are uh, have legitimate fears and mm -hmm. legitimate apprehensions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a big adjustment process for them to move beyond seeing Islam as an ideology and see Muslims as people. Exactly. To see them as people who have many of the same struggles that we do. Uh, that's not to glorify Islam or to condone uh, what the Quran teaches, but that's to put us on that playing field again of mm -hmm. we're all sinners lost without Christ. Um, and I don't go to somebody else and say, well, you're a sinner and you need Christ. My job as a follower of Christ is to say, I'm a fellow sinner. Mm -hmm. Let's journey together to find what help what deliverance God has for us. Hmm. I mean, you can't go to a girl that you want to date and say, you know, your father's a jerk and your mother's a whore. Are you interested in going out with me? <laughs> and I think that that's sort of how a lot of people talk about Muslims mm -hmm. rather than allowing uh, every word that comes out of our mouths to be edifying mm -hmm. and to be Christ focused. I don't know which gospel is in. Maybe one of you Bible guys, um, I should know. I'm a Bible guy, too. Um, you know, Jesus is a young boy, and he's journeying back from Jerusalem, and he's gone for several days, right? And his parents finally realize, you know, which chapter it is? It's in Luke. Luke, there you yeah. go. Where's Jesus? Yeah. Three days. You, yeah. you know, your son's yeah. gone. Yeah. Suddenly you realize yeah. he's gone. Yeah. And they find him in the temple. And the religious leaders marvel at his yeah. understanding. And it says he was sitting among them, listening to them. And asking them questions. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because I think sometimes this is not just with Muslims. I think it's just evangelism. We want to debate people into the kingdom. Right. But to sit down, I mean, they marveled at his learning. What did he do? He sat among them. He listened to them and he asked them questions. You talked mm -hmm. about that too. Mm -hmm. Again, this transcends um, just reaching out to Muslims. I think it's just evangelism in general. Mm -hmm. It's that type of interaction creates the opportunity to share the gospel. Exactly. A few years ago, I was living with my family in the USSR. That tells you several years ago. <laughs> and uh, Muslims had returned to this peninsula in uh, huge numbers. And the people of Ukraine at the time, uh, the peninsula belonged to Ukraine at that time, and they were so scared by these Muslims thinking that they would all become terrorists. And I was trying to help these Ukrainians figure out how do you make friends? And so I just went out and started uh, praying for the village. And I finally walked up to a lady who was doing laundry and I started asking her, you know, I'm trying to learn about your village. Is there anyone here who could tell me the stories of your of your background? And, and she said, well, yes, I'm willing to do that, but, but who are you? And I explained that I was a man who believed in praying about problems. And she said, well, my husband's got pneumonia. Would you come inside and pray for him right now? <laughs> this is a Muslim family. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was obviously not a Muslim. I went inside, prayed for her husband. Came back the next day, and unbeknownst to me, the husband had gotten better. I mean, God had obviously worked. Right. She said, look, you prayed for my husband yesterday. He got better. There's a family next door. Their baby has pneumonia, too. Would you pray for the baby also? We went and prayed for the baby, and one thing led to another. Before long, this village had become best friends with our family, and we'd become best friends with them. Along about that time, the religious leader of the peninsula as a whole came out of the village, called all the people together, and said, you're no longer allowed to have this man come into your houses. And one by one, the people in the village just got up and started walking away. And he said, well, what are you doing? And they turned around and said, well, how long has it been since you came out and prayed for the 90-year-old <laughs> widow who has a cold house? And another man with the baby said, and when did you pray for a baby? And the Muslim guy said, I don't understand what you mean. I've never been here before. Exactly, they said. And they walked out wow. and left him. And uh, after he was gone, the, the religious leader left. The, the village leader and I were left there in the room alone. And I turned to him and said, now what? And he said, we go back to work together. Yeah. So I think prayer and friendship sometimes mm -hmm. can overcome even the 
figure of what would have been a radical situation. I think some of our audience may be a little frustrated with us because we keep talking about the majority of Muslims yeah. when the topic is radical. There Islam. you go. And so I think we have to mm -hmm. push into this question a little Let's bit harder. Dive right when in. people are seeking to destroy us, seeking to attack us, mm -hmm. uh, seeking to murder us, and being quite successful at that, not just with us, but with other Muslims, how does those who follow Christ respond in that situation? I love to talk about the vast majority of Muslims, but I think that people still have that question. Yeah. Our government's response may need to be one thing. Our question here is how do Christians respond? I think prayer is certainly one, praying for the victims of violence, Muslims and Christians. And so I agree with that piece there. But do we have other pieces that we could offer our audience? Well, I think we do, but we have to remember this is a, 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 a startlingly um, sophisticated spiritual de deception. Mm -hmm. That I, I met a driver in Jordan in December. And I, I said, yeah, I, I see the women here and they're wearing, you can't be deceived by the outward appearances, but it just seems like such a, a joyless religion to me. And he said, it's, Islam is the worst curse that ever came on the Middle East. Mm -hmm. He said it just, it just brings bondage and it brings uh, no peace and no freedom and no security. And I think we take confidence in the power of the gospel, mm -hmm. the Bible says in Corinthians, to liberate those who are blinded. I mean, Satan has deliberately yeah. deluded uh, billions of people. And mm -hmm. the solution is the proclamation of the gospel. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, I, and I think radical Islam in particular, the best response is how about radical Jesus followers? And what are the two? If, if people, the nonviolent kind, I hope. Yeah, the nonviolent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. What is what does a radical Jesus follower look like? Well, he's somebody that's willing to die trying to reach somebody that's bought into radical Islam. Don't, don't you for think the that sake many, of the many many Muslims join out of peer pressure? Join out of the same reason that oh, people absolutely. people join gangs. Yeah, absolutely. They want the affinity. They, they want yeah, the fraternity. Absolutely. And, and they, they, I don't believe. And I don't have a lot of Muslim relationships, but but I do. I, I don't think they're finding their salvation that they're looking for. No, no. I think one of the answers that we need to bring to our audience is 86% of Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, don't know somebody like us. They don't know a believer That's right. in Christ. Absolutely. And so we have a tremendous opportunity to respond to radical Islam by taking away their recruits before they're radical. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Absolutely. By showing love to, to the immigrant, to the refugee, mm -hmm. to the widow, to the orphan. This demonstrates to people that they have an alternative mm -hmm. to radicalization. Um, when, when in, unfortunately, we get caught up in, in something that feels like we're labeling all Muslims, we inadvertently participate with our enemy to push Muslims towards mm -hmm. marginalization. And I think we need, to rec we need to be smart, wise, and recognize that our our true understanding of the evil of oppressive mm. regimes does not mean that we need to cooperate with them by in leaving people feeling like they don't have an alternative mm. choice. You know, um, our winsomeness needs to provide love. You know, so you look at international students in the United States, many of them who are from uh, Saudi Arabia, other places like that. If they're not invited into a Christian home, shown mm -hmm. a meal of love, mm -hmm. because we're concerned with Arab young men, yeah. that, well, that's a lost opportunity, and it, mm -hmm. and it feeds the potential for radicalization. You hear anecdotal stories like that, yeah. the bomber in Boston saying, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. how nobody had shown him friendship. And isn't it interesting that you asked this question on the day after this big conference just met in Europe, and I understand they pledged how many billion was it? with a huge number of billions of dollars. I don't even want to say a number because I'll be wrong. $30 billion, I think, that they pledged. I think we can pray for our government leaders to have wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a, yeah. we're a far cry from the day when when our government leader, and I won't even say his name, said, we will beat, you know, this force. And now we're understanding this force is hard to beat. It's not a state that fights with uniforms. Mm -hmm. They don't uh, march in straight lines, you know. This is very, very difficult in the radical side. So I think we need to pray for our leaders to have wisdom as they confront the evildoers and as they build friendships through like aid like this that can maybe do more than some of our military units can do. No, to that point, I, I, they're unbeatable. It's a brilliant strategy uh, of infiltration. But I think we can, and our audience can take comfort in the fact that Jesus said that a house divided will not stand. And the Achilles heel of Islam is, is that the, the Saudi Arabian Muslims hate 
the Iranian Islam, Islamists almost as much as they hate Israel. I mean, there is a div deep, deep division be between Sunni and Shia. It needs to be recognized. You mentioned fight radical Islam with radical Christianity, a radical lover and follower of Jesus. Yes. Um, we've talked about prayer a lot. You know, I think of Second Corinthians. 10, I think it's three through five, though we live in the world, we do not wage wars, the world does. Amen. The weapons we fight with are not of this world. Amen. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen. These are people who are under Satan's grip, just as we were. Mm -hmm. And you know, someone prayed mm -hmm. us through that and out of that, right? Absolutely. So prayer, but I think radical acts of love, you know, Christians in the prosperous West, we've had this time of home field advantage. Yes. And it's not just Islam that's affecting that, it's cultural shifts yes. in America. And it's becoming, how do we say this? Um, the, the risks and dangers associated with being identified with Jesus Christ are not going down, they're going up. Yes. On a continuum of persecution, believers in the West, it's going up and it's probably only going to get worse. And in a lot of ways, that's a positive thing because the people who are just affiliated by name and not real followers, we know what happens when persecution comes. Yes. But what I think of is this moving towards danger and risk for the sake of the gospel. Yes. Well, let's be frank. Um, I said it earlier, but there will be bloodshed, especially for missionaries who go serve in these places overseas. It's going to happen. Right. And there's probably going to be more bloodshed even on this side of the country. Mm -hmm. And we need to pray for our government and pray for, you know, they have wisdom, all those things. But as believers to say, I count my life you know, not worth, yeah. not worthy of anything compared yes. to the surpassing greatness of finishing this task mm -hmm. that Jesus has given me. And I just think, if we unpack that a little bit, what does it look like? What do those radical acts of love look like? Um, you know, demonstrated by, you know, our viewing audience. How do you, mold, how do you stir your church to not move away, but to move towards? I think when they meet real live Muslims, mm -hmm. um, it helps uh, humanize that issue. So I like to take uh, my friends with me to hang out with Muslims. Uh, that's not to ignore the ideology of Islam. Mm -hmm. That's to uh, make sure that we see uh, the people that God loves. Mm -hmm. It's really true. I was talking with a pastor yesterday, and he was telling a story about one of his members who had gone and visited with one of our teams and served with them. And he said before this guy went, he was completely ethnically biased against Muslims. He just believed that they were all here to spy on us and all the kinds of negative things you can hear. And when he went, it happened that he served in one of our teams where especially the team leader just loves Muslim people. He loves everything, Arab. He, he just studies the language constantly. He, he believes these folks get short-sighted. While this guy was there, he saw a different side, exactly like you're talking, Keith. And this uh, pastor yesterday said, when he came home, he was completely changed. And what it has done now has caused him to be active in reaching out to his community mm. in a way that they would have never imagined. And he said that one weekend has literally changed this guy's life and all the people now that he's impacted just because of what you're talking about. Well, well Jesus said, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Mm -hmm. I think we need to recognize the dangers and, and respond. I think there's a deep hunger in the heart of all Muslims. There, there has to be. They're no different than any other lost soul in the world. Right. Yeah. And I, and I would say, you know, piggybacking on what you said earlier, um, we, we have, there's an incredible international student ministry in my hometown where I live now. And the reality of it is like 92% of international students that come to America never see the inside of an American's home. And so we're in the midst right now of, of mobilizing the people in our church to begin hosting international students mm -hmm. for dinners mm -hmm. in groups, four to six international students. And our specific section, we have 1,200 students that are coming in in the next few months from Saudi Arabia um, studying at the local university. And so, you know, getting the people in the church to engage relationally with those that are from other countries, particularly those from Islamic countries, yeah. is, is the best way, in a sense, to, to get them to see what it's really important. I think, I think we also, um, this is hard. This will be hard for our audience. I think we also need to stand against uh, worldly logic that doesn't display kingdom values. Yes. Ezekiel 33, 11 says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their yes. evil lives and yes. live. And so that's our hope of the gospel in the midst of, of incredible difficulties. Can we adopt a terrorist and pray for him to be changed? That's a website. Yeah, uh, <laughs> You can do that. Okay. Yeah. That is a radical yes. response mm -hmm. yes. of a demonstration of kingdom hope yes. in the midst of an era wow. of radical Islam.
Yeah. Yes, it starts inside the heart of each of us. Um, I had to ask myself this recently. I just kind of had to face facts. Am I living out locally what I would do when I'm visiting one of our teams in a Muslim yes. land? Am I, am I living that out locally? So I've recently been uh, doing some what you would call prayer walking, and I just take a few people with me and I just knock on doors in these areas where people are immigrants from other lands and knock on doors and say, hey, we're just in the area today. We're praying for people to see if uh, you have some kind of need. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And, you know, ladies lance at the door with uh, completely veiled uh, the youngsters will come to the door and throw it open and, and then realize, you know, what's going on. He'll yell for his dad to come. He's a guy from, you know, uh, Yemen or whatever. And, and this is a strange thing. He'll say, well, I'm Muslim. And we say, well, that's fine. We can pray for you as well. And I've been shocked at wow. how they will invite us into the yeah, house, absolutely. serve us tea, yeah. more so than the United yeah. States of America yeah, typical absolutely. family would. Yes. And we sit down and talk. And you know what they want help with is their 16-year-old can't do this math that they're having to yeah, do that's right. geometry or something. And, right. and uh, once that happens, people, one lady told me just two weeks ago, she said, I would have never believed it. I would have never believed that you could actually knock on the door of a stranger yeah. from, you know, the Middle East. And be invited into their home just like that, and they don't know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Some of this uh, clash that we're involved in is trying to provoke that uh, building of walls between our communities. I, think, I mean, I live in a very heavily Mormon part of the U.S., and those young guys come to our door, and I, f and I feel like the game is yeah. to, to reinforce them into their community by having them repeatedly rejected again and again. I don't want to participate in that kind of a model. So uh, I don't want to have to listen to their diatribe for the third time when I could probably give it to them themselves too. So well, how do I respond to that situation? Right. I've just been convicted that when they knock on my door, my goal is not to shut them up as quick as I can and get rid of them, but it's to humanize that encounter, to treat them how Jesus would. So mm -hmm. I invite them in. Mm -hmm. I say, can I get you some water? Um, I'd be glad, glad to listen to your spiel. Probably a lot of people don't want to listen to your spiel. Um, but can you also tell me, when's the last time you talked to your mom? Do you have a girlfriend? What are you going to do after you finish your mission? And that's very deflating. You're getting them off uh, off of their, their grid. Off well, of yeah. Their and, and, you know, some of them want to, you know, I'm not supposed to get off script. And yeah. so they, they want to leave. But um, we have an opportunity mm, to absolutely. behave in a way which is conspicuously different. Yes. Than other people expect. That's the way that the, the woman at the well encountered Jesus. So much so that she went back into her town and said, you got to meet this guy. That's right. Yeah. Keith, why'd you have to share that story? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm being convicted now. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think what we're concluding here, the threats are real. Mm -hmm. yeah. The dangers are legitimate. But as followers of Christ, the best response is a kingdom response and not to minimize that there needs to be real political responses from our government and everything else. But the way to fight it is with radical love, radical Christ-like love. Amen. That's how it's going to be overcome. Right. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being a part of this important conversation. Continue the conversation at missiontable.org. This episode of The Mission Table has been sponsored by Encountering the World of Islam Embracing Muslims with the Love of Christ Growth Mission Investing in people and organizations to maximize kingdom growth and in partnership with Shepherd Staff Facilitating Churches to Send Well and 1615 Church Missions Coaching